Hi there, and welcome to the Explaining History podcast. And the thing I want to talk about today are the um, ideas and intellectuals that developed from the Institute for Social Research at the Goethe University in Frankfurt, um, better known as the Frankfurt School. Um, this was a, a wide range of uh, theorists, uh, intellectuals and um, philosophers who attempted to address some of the most pressing questions um, of, of life really facing human beings in the 20th century. There have been few other institutions in the past hundred years that have had quite such an impact on 20th century thought. So which, this is why I wanted to um, uh, address it today. The, uh, the range and the quantity of ideas that poured forth from the uh, Frankfurt School are probably, it's probably too broad to go into today. So I want to look at a couple of key figures and then talk about some of the themes that really um, hold, them, hold their arguments and ideas together. The school um, was established by um, a, a Marxist heir to an agricultural fortune, Felix Weil, who believed that uh, he could create an institution which could marry together the various strands of Marxist thought, which uh, in the early 20th century, really as a result of the uh, the internecine warfare on the left in the late 19th century and the um, chaos wrought by the Russian Revolution um, were many and diverse. He thought that there, these could be brought together and synthesised into um, a, a new Marxist position that would perhaps bring about dramatic social change, uh, not in the East but in the West. The um, first meeting of um, left academics from across Europe and left intellectuals from across Europe was deemed to be an immense success and Weil thought, well, this is going to work. Um, and so he began to invest large sums of money in 1922 um, in Germany uh, into building an institute. And it's interesting to think of the context here. This is um, at a period of time where there has been a, a failed rising on the left that's been bloodily put down by um, the, the Weimar government in 19, January 1919 and uh, with the help of the Fry Corps, um, there, uh, there has been a coup attempt in 1920, and there would, uh, on the right, the Cap Putsch, and the following year, in 1923, there'd be another coup attempt by uh, fa the failed Munich Putsch by Hitler, um, in, uh, which is, um, again, put down. So we're in a time of immense political polarisation and chaos and, and political violence. And we're also in a period of time where there is a profusion of, an explosion of new ideas about Germany. The Kaiser, having been swept away, has been replaced now by a, a democratic government, which is, uh, whilst in some ways a pariah on the international scene, in other ways it's becoming far more integrated politically and diplomatically into the system of, of world governance than um, it has, uh, it, that Germany has, has ever been. Um, the, uh, the creation of a republic, um, the um, event of a democratic revolution at the end of 1918, seems to have um, unleashed in Germany in the 1920s all manner of powerful cultural, creative and intellectual forces ideas about class, gender, sexuality uh, are openly and vigorously debated. During the second half of the 1920s, Berlin becomes the cultural epicentre, really, of the world. A wide range of uh, cultural luminaries make their way to Berlin. Photographers like Robert Kappa, filmmakers like Billy Wilder. Um, you have homegrown talents such as Bertolt Brecht and Kurt Weill. Um, a whole range of um, artists such as uh, Max Ernst, um, who create all sorts of challenging and controversial and uh, in some ways very unpopular works of art, uh, criticising the, the Great War. Eric Maria Remarque, the uh, writer of All Quiet on the Western Front. Um, 
and the uh, there's an immense amount of um, interest in uh, Berlin from um, places from Hollywood. The there is a a flow of talent from Berlin to Hollywood and vice versa, and then there's also a a kind of a very subversive side to uh, Berlin. Um, Christopher Isherwood, the gay British writer, uh, wrote um, extensively about um, the uh, the seedier, darker side of of uh, Berlin, of prostitutes and cross dressers and rent boys and um, the kind of um, uh, the kind of forbidden sexualities that horrified people like Hitler. Uh, Hitler himself looked upon Berlin as this kind of corrupt and seedy place somewhere that um he um that needed to be kind of changed and ordered and rebuilt and part of his views about um creating Germania, this city of the future, which would have been, you know, the uh his answer to ancient Rome, was to sweep away this um unordered and um in his views sexually depraved and racially and culturally compromised place, uh, Berlin. So it's no wonder that you get a new institution developing that has initially kind of um, has Marxist foundations, but has a, a wider develops a wider remit amongst its its chief um, academics, who are looking to try to explain really this essentially the new world of the twentieth century that Berlin and later the rest of the world as they see it appears to have found itself in. The intellectuals of the Berlin School had lived through, really, the Marxist or the, the communist moment in um, Europe at the end of the First World War from 1918 to 1919 um, was the, the moment at which it became clear that once the Russian Revolution had happened in Europe, it wasn't going to be replicated in Western Europe. And the question begs itself, why had the working classes not done this? Why had the working classes not done something that appeared to be cheap, clearly in their in their interests? I mean, with the benefit of hindsight, we can argue that perhaps it, it wasn't in the, the, the interests of the working classes. Um, but in the context, in the moment, that was not an idea that um, was particularly uh, popular or, or well received. The feeling that many of the people at the, the Frankfurt School had was that the working classes had done something really to um, benefit those who, who ruled them. And the question as to why really, really baffled them. So one of Marx's key predictions that revolution would happen in Germany, or at least an advanced uh, industrialised West European country, uh, and certainly not in Russia, that part of the, uh, the Marx um, view of his history um, had not come true. And so now the task came upon the Frankfurt School to look through what in Marx worked and what didn't. And in this process, many of the um, Frankfurt School thinkers began to combine Marxist ideas with other ideas, other ideas such as, for example, psychoanalysis, or later in the 1930s and 40s, existentialism. And many began to challenge the um, grand narratives, really, of the Enlightenment itself, the idea that mankind was on this upward trajectory from unreason to reason, to, to, from religion to science, um, that modernism would bring a, um, a, a level of technological sophistication and harmony and peace to all. These ideas that had very been, uh, been very popular before the First World War the, the Frankfurt School now now challenged and questioned, particularly as um, Hitler became increasingly popular in Germany. The um, intellectuals of the Frankfurt School, particularly Theodor Adorno and Max Horkheimer, both argued that um, what was taking place was a counter-enlightenment, um, that the that an anti-enlightenment... Um, that the the tools of the Enlightenment, science and technological process, had actually provided uh, mankind with um, the uh, means of um, derailing humanity from the the utopia promised 
and uh, create and the Enlightenment itself had created the um, the seeds of, of a new kind of barbarism. The First World War um, gave plenty of evidence for this, and at the end of the Second World War, Adorno looked to the Holocaust and to the dropping of the atomic bomb on Hiroshima. Now, Theodore Adorno is an interesting guy to look at, um, and he was one of a number of the Frankfurt Schoolers who went to America. Adorno, um, a Jewish, a German Marxist intellectual, um, left Germany in 1934 quite wisely, um, and he, um, he, he found himself... Uh, on sojourn in uh, places like Oxford University in Los Angeles. Um, he did pop back to Germany to see his parents uh, periodically. Um, but he, um, the Frankfurt School in, in its entirety um, eventually uh, relocated itself to, uh, to New York. Adorno was a uh, composer by trade. He... As a young man, he had been able to listen to Stravinsky, to Hindemith, and to um, the great new modernist composers uh, of the uh, early 20th century. Again, people despised by Hitler, who thought that music should be classical and traditional. He saw that many of the great intellectual figures that he had viewed as being um, part, part of the left um, People such as the sociologist Max Weber, for example, um, came out in, in support of the, the Kaiser's War in 1914. And the, there was a kind of a huge distrust um, from Adorno and his, from his contemporaries towards these intellectual figures, seeing them um, to be utterly compromised by this reactionary act. It's very interesting similarities uh, between that and the kind of the distrust um, that the uh, 60s radicals um, in uh, Germany in 1968 seemed to have for their uh, their elders and betters, supposedly. Um, and um, it, it seems to be this recurring theme on the, in, within the, 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 German, the German left. Um, the uh, writing that Adorno does eventually is that... A, Part of the the philosophy of aesthetics, you know, he he looks at um, the uh, how how one can make sense of what we like, um, how one can make sense of what is good, what is bad culturally, what are what are good, what is good music, what is bad music, um, and he has a particular argument that, or and this comes out in his uh, book, the culture industry. Um, which is 1955, I think, um, where he said that all music, any music that is of any value at all, should be oppositional. It should be hard to listen to. It should almost attack uh, conventional bourgeois notions of, of what music is. Um, he wrote that when he was in uh, America. Um, at the same time that Eric Fromm, if you listened to uh, my podcast on Eric Fromm, um, when at the same time that Eric Fromm was writing The Sane Society, um, which was a critique of whether of a kind of uh, post-war consumerist society and its uh, general effects on our sanity, um, Adorno wrote The Culture Industry um, in a, a period when in a period of a kind of unprecedented wealth and prosperity in America, and he looked at um, American consumerism um, and looked at American music, and he made a number of points. He said that American music was in, 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 it existed in much the same way that kind of new American Cadillacs did. There was a surface level of interchangeability. American sort of pop songs and crooning songs at the time and barbershop quartets and all this sort of thing it essentially had the same structure, but you could bolt different bits on, different oohs and ahs and different sounds on to make it appear to be a kind of a, a different song. But it wasn't. You're consuming the same thing over and over again. The idea that people like this, that, this, that people gain um, pleasures from this, was rather lost on uh, Adorno. He seems to have been this kind of frenetic 
uh, rant against um, uh, American consumerism and mass culture. And the book The Culture Industry became one of the standards uh, on the... Um, not just on the new left, but in various the, the various emerging cultural studies discourses in the sixties and seventies, um, and it was one of the kind of the, the 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 great cornerstones of of the the study of mass culture. It's still a very valid, very useful book. I mean, a lot a lot of it um, you I I would kind of tend to discount now, but in terms of its significance to the debate about what mass culture is and where it comes from and what it is about uh, and and why it exists and what it does it is um uh, it's a valuable book at the same time um i think it was perhaps slightly earlier um an american um sort of former trotskyite anarchist and general kind and cultural thinker um a raging alcoholic and general kind of um subversive counter sort of proto kind of countercultural figure dwight macdonald um wrote about um what he called mass culture and he said that you know originally um back in the middle ages culture was generated within communities so culture was a kind of an organic product of say, a, a, a village in medieval England or in medieval Germany or, or what have you. And it was the stories and the folk songs that were created in a fairly organic and authentic way to try to describe the world around um, uh, uh, around the people. Um, he said that culture in the period of the Industrial Revolution was uh, appropriated uh, by essentially the capitalist classes, mass produced and sold back to the people, so that um, publishing, um, the production of music, um, the creation of things like cinema and television, now meant that there was a um, a mass culture um, that was mass produced for a mass audience. And this was really a, a, a product of, of the Industrial Revolution. And there were all sorts of notions uh, implicit in there that culture was delivered in a, in a top-down way, that people were simply uh, recipients. Uh, and Adorno kind of suggests this as well, that people are essentially pliant recipients of culture. Later on, another um, uh, contributor contribution to the debate, probably the, the best one, was by a guy called John Fisk, who said that, well, that's not really what happens, is it? People are very discriminating, they're very selective when they watch TV programmes, they shows they like, shows they don't, they project all sorts of um, their own perspectives onto TV programmes, they interact with them, they switch them off, they change channel, um, they talk about them with their friends. Um, and he said that culture is the thing that's created when the text meets the individual, which is an interestingly kind of Roland Barthian sort of perspective, you know, that um, the the age of the monolithic author is, is dead, Roland Barthes argued, and he said that ultimately um, the um, a new text is created every time somebody re reads a book. Uh, I simplify what he's arguing an awful lot. But he said that, you know, when person one reads you know, The Hobbit, it is not the same reading that person two has because they have their own their own sort of individual um, mental universes to bring to the text and to impose their own fantasies onto it and interact in different ways, find different bits interesting and, and create and create meaning. And that's perhaps one of the... the, the Roland Barthes and, uh, and John Fisk have perhaps the most nuanced versions of... Of, of kind of what cultural creation is all about. Um, the other uh, great kind of uh, exile from Germany who really settled in uh, America was um, Herbert Marcuse. And Herbert Marcuse's influence on the post-war left is um, perhaps more significant than any other member of the, the Frankfurt School. He wrote a book, the One Dimensional Man in 1964, which um, covered as many topics as Eric Fromm does in his uh, various works, um, The Fear of Freedom and The Sane Society. Um, it, it was a really uh, extensive piece on mass society in general because um, Marcuse 
looked at uh, the development of um, the of, of Soviet society as well as the development of, of American capitalist consumerism. And he argues really that in both um, totalitarianist communism um, and in Western capitalism, there is very little space for the individual, for um, people to have to be multidimensional, to express themselves in all sorts in all sorts of ways that are natural and authentic. When he was looking at um, Western capitalism, he was particularly interested in consumerism, advertising, and those aspects of Western culture. And he said, well, this generates false needs. You know, we're constantly told we need a new car, a new wristwatch, a new wife, a new house, a new this and a new that. He said, that means that capitalism has to exist on an an immense amount of waste. He said that the idea that capitalism is an efficient system is is a total fantasy because efficient systems don't create landfills full of rubbish, of stuff that people chuck away after um, a couple of years. And he said that false needs mean that we are enslaved, really, to, uh, you know, we're, we're constantly told that we, we need all this stuff in order to create, you know, you know in order to allow capitalism to and consumerism and manufacturing of uh, products to continue turning over. But we don't, and it means that any other kind of um, intellectual or uh, emotional uh, pursuit um is uh, is not possible and it, it, and it's is essentially restricted and in many ways kind of punished within consumerist society he said, he said this is a kind of a, a form of soft totalitarianism because our abilities to dissent to have oppositional thoughts to um you know to be um inquiring to have critical thinking are stifled. And they're not stifled by the state, by secret policemen waving truncheons. They're stifled by the um, by the television, by the the power of uh, of, consu- of of consuming pleasures that, to um, sort of snuff out the, these kind of radical thoughts. He suggests that um, we should adopt a, a position called a great refusal. Um, and to um, dissent from the, uh, the, 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 the norms of consumerist society. And that um, negative thinking um, was the only sort of alternative. By negative thinking, it, he meant that as a, re- um, a rejection of positivism, positivism is really the idea of the Enlightenment, that we understand the world around us, um, we know about you know, night and day, wet and cold, you know, light and dark, all these things, and therefore we can reason them, and um, that our critical faculties of reason and logic are enough to navigate the world perfectly, um, and thus will kind of lead humanity on this upward trajectory. And uh, negative thinking really challenges that. It says, well, we can't do all that. We don't know all the answers that we don't have. We're not able to... um, uh, understand the world in that way that there is we are quite irrational creatures um, and that the enlightenment is not the solution that it is uh, is, is posited to be um, the the negativism doesn't really present a, an alternative explanation it just simply challenges the narrative uh, of the enlightenment and he said we needed to to really to really do that to be uh, dissenting in individuals um, and that a kind of an existential revolution needed to take place within Western society. And this existential um, revolution needed to take place um, because a, a real revolution, a class revolution, wasn't going to happen. That the working classes had been perfectly assimilated into capitalist society and were loyal to it, um, enjoyed the benefits of it, uh, or thought they did anyway, um, and um, was a, and had ne- and were willing to fight to defend it, as um, many examples in the twentieth century show. You know, you have um, the, the the working uh, America's working classes were the most enthusiastic supporters of um, Richard Nixon and the Vietnam War, for example. When uh, you have uh, it's predominantly kind of 
uh, middle class intellectual dissenters. Uh, the um, uh, the appeal of um, Herbert Marcuse to the the new left in the nineteen sixties was immense because he'd rejected. They had by that point rejected Soviet communism as the solution, as the antidote um, that the the old left had embraced during the 1930s and 40s. It had been proven itself to be as violent and corrupt as any of the worst despotisms of the 20th century. And so um, he embraced a a new... uh, He does what the Frankfurt School um, does. He selects aspects of Marxism, combines them with other radical and left philosophies and created um, an, a, an answer, created a, an, an argument that seemed to unite um, the various sort of radical um, aspects of the new left in the, in, in the 60s, um, the anti-Vietnam War protests, the feminist movement, uh, the black power movement. And it, it was one, the one-dimensional man um, was one of the books that that not only um, it becomes a massive um, uh, a, a massive um, massively influential amongst that um, uh, group um, of, of essentially the counterculture in the nineteen sixties, but it also becomes one of the kind of the platforms for post sixties, you know, the seventies and eighties um, identity politics. So the the development of the politics. Of um, of gender, sexuality, and um, and race. It's interesting these days that very little is said about Marcuse or Adorno or Eric Fromm or any of the other Frankfurt schoolers on the left themselves. They seem to have moved away from these radical critiques rather a lot. Um, some of the some of them are a bit redundant now. You might argue, but um, their importance and significance can't be ignored. One way you can always hear about them is to turn into the um, in the, the kind of the rabid world of Fox News, where Fox News commentators frequently mention the Frankfurt School as as part of some kind of el- elaborate conspiracy theory. So uh, it shows that uh, on the uh, in the fringes of the uh, the frothing right, these. Um, uh, essentially fairly mild-mannered um, German and Marxist intellectuals still hold some boogeyman kind of kind of power. Yes, the, the various kind of scribblers and ranters on the kind of obscurantist fringe of uh, American libertarian right-wing discourse um, look at the um, uh, immigration of um, the various members of the Frankfurt School, who came to America in the 1930s, and say, well, you know, this is where the where the rot set in, where these kind of un-American ideas seeped into our society. But anyway, um, I hope you found that interesting and stimulating, and I will catch you on the next Explaining History podcast. All the best. Bye bye.